Welcome to the Voices for Voices TV show and podcast, sponsored by Redwood Living. Thank you for joining us today. I am Justin Allen Hayes, founder and executive director of Voices for Voices, host and humanitarian. You can learn more about Voices for Voices on our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube channel at Voices for Voices or you can check out our website at voicesforvoices.org. Voices for Voices is a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization, also referred to as an NGO, that survives solely on donations. So if you are able to, please consider heading over to voicesforvoices.org to help us continue our mission and the goal and dream of mine to help 3 billion people over the course of my lifetime and beyond. Or you can also send a donation to the mailing address of Voices for Voices at 2388 Beckett Circle, that's in Stowe, Ohio, 44224. Or you can also find us on the Cash App at Voices for Voices. All donations 100% tax deductible. Are you or somebody you know looking for a volunteer opportunity? If so, you can reach out to us today via our email at president at voicesforvoices.org. Now I founded Voices for Voices to provide a platform for folks to share their stories with others as we work to break the stigma around mental health accessibility, and disabilities, helping people get the help they need, and also helping them prepare and or transition into the workforce with the Voices for Voices Career Center, where we connect talent with opportunity for both job seekers and employers alike, from coast to coast and in every industry and job level. And who can forget about merchandise? The Voices for Voices merchandise shop is up and running at voicesforvoices.org forward slash shop, where shipping is always free. And again, all donations are 100% tax deductible. In today's episode today, uh, we are joined by our special guest. Uh, I believe he's in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he has declared a, a emergency on trauma, state of emergency on childhood trauma and trauma in general. Uh, he's a father, an author, a producer, uh, an advocate. Uh, there's really nothing that the, our, our guest doesn't do and, and hasn't done. And we want to have him on our show because he is an important voice, uh, not only in the state of Ohio, uh, but also uh, across the United States. And we thought it would be Great to have him share his voice again and uh, with our audience and connect with as many people as possible uh, because I, I have a feeling that uh, a, lot of, a lot of us uh, may have uh, some synergies with some of the topics that uh, he's going to talk about today. And so our guest is joining us uh, on Zoom. Uh, he is Mr. Ronald A. Hammond. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Wow, uh, where to where to start? Um, let's start with the the childhood trauma that has uh, been uh, the foundation of, of a lot of the work that that you're doing today. That there might be uh, some uh, relatability with with uh, our our viewers and our listeners. Well, childhood trauma is the most pervasive issue that the world has ever seen. And sadly, it gets addressed with kids' gloves. You know, we uh, we, we don't give it the, the aggression, you know what I'm saying, or the assertion that it needs to really deal with the issue. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't really understand what childhood trauma is or just, you know, the effects that it has on, on us personally, on our communities, on our country. Right. We we know the expressions of trauma. So the expressions of trauma is what we see on the news every day around the world. You know, the violence, the poverty, 
These are all expressions of trauma, broken communities, broken families. But we don't understand it to be to be childhood trauma, you know, related issues, right? So, of course, you know, we, we'll, we'll put it up under the same category as mental health, mm -hmm. which really waters it down because childhood trauma is not mental health. It's not a cognitive issue. It's a physical issue. It's a bodily issue. It's a biological issue. And as long as we keep, you know, just focusing on, on mental health mm -hmm. and, and not separating those two, it'll never really get addressed the way that it needs to. Yeah. Uh... And so you your, yourself uh, have undergone uh, some some of that, that that trauma that has really really helped give you the the voice and in, in the in the platform uh, to not just talk about things in terms of you know the the book definitions and in the and uh, the book theories, but actually you know your lived lived experience uh, of going through that and being able to relate with, with individuals uh, that have and uh, are uh, unfortunately experiencing some of that. Uh, can, you, can you touch on a little bit on how you're able to relate so strongly to uh, the, the childhood trauma piece? So I was conceived by rape. I was adopted at the age of five to a man that beat me until he drew blood. Um, he was my first bully and, you know, in-home bully it's almost worse than, you know, a school bully or, you know, a bully on the street. Because I had to see this man every day, all day. Um, by the age of 12, I wanted to know who my biological father was, thinking that, you know, that would be an escape for me. And my biological father was a crack and heroin. So it was like jumping from the fire, from the, from the frying pan to the fire. Um, so the, the abuse only got worse. Um, the abandonment only got worse. I slept in abandoned houses with him. You know, we would kick in doors during the winter time of abandoned houses, you know, just to find a place to sleep. So that trauma shaped my life, you know, because we're talking about a wide range of, of, of traumatic impacts mm -hmm. that lasted during the duration of my entire childhood, even into my younger adult years. And that led to me really struggling with relationships. You know what I'm saying? Because of those abandonment issues, those trust issues, um, you know, isolation. And as I got older, I didn't I, I still didn't know what childhood trauma was. I didn't, you know, of course I knew that the, the term mm -hmm. trauma. Like I said, I didn't know what, 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 what trauma really was as far as, you know, the how, how it affected our daily lives. So I understood my story to be a story of overcoming. Yeah. That's all I knew. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So Going from there, I, you know, I, I became a successful entrepreneur, you know, best-selling author. I, I didn't know that there was unhealed trauma because I thought that I overcame everything uh, because I became successful. Mm -hmm. And it was the suicide death of my firstborn son mm -hmm. that led me to go deeper because I, I, I didn't understand that. I'm like, what, what is this? Where did this come from? How did this happen? No parent expected something like that, whatever. You know, happened to them. So, as I started uh, uh, doing my research, uh, I took a couple of classes, okay. and it was at a behavioral health class that I took that I was introduced to childhood trauma for the first time in my life. Okay. Like I said, you know, the, the, the clinical definition of it, but then go even deeper, the actual biological, you know, effects of childhood trauma, and that's when I understood my story. Once you know, learning my son's story helped me to understand mine. And, 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 and once I realized how pervasive this issue was, I was sad. I was sad because, you know, you see the Black Lives Matter movements and so many other movements, right? That, you know, gone global, global warming, all these different movements, but there had never been a movement for childhood trauma. And this is the issue that the world should be focusing on. And I decided, you know what? I'll create the movement. So I did a, a hunger strike. I did a 48 hour hunger strike on the steps of our state house in Columbus in December. And let me remind you, um, Columbus code is not Cincinnati code. Okay. <laughs> Columbus code is more like Cleveland code. Cincinnati's code is, you know, kind of like Kentucky. Okay. So we have 40, 50 degree weather, you know, in the winter time. 
this was during a time when it was very cold. I did this hunger strike in December, uh, December 18th. And, uh, but I knew that a radical issue deserved a radical response. So I became that radical response. And this is how I kicked off the movement. And I start, slowly started bringing, you know, people in to, uh, to join me, be a part of the movement, you know, some psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, mental health therapists. And from there, you know, we started really building what that looked like because I didn't I didn't know anything about politics at the time, but okay. I was told by a Republican once, a conservative, he told me, he said, he asked me the question, he said, what do you think got you, got you there, got you all there? He was speaking of the black community primarily. He said, what do you think got you all there? And, you know, so of course I gave, you know, my perspective and he said, no, he said, I'm gonna give you one word, policy. Policy is what's got you there. Policy is what's gonna get you out. So I decided, okay, cool. So how are we going to shape policy in a way to where it affects our trauma? And I wanted to find a model. So the model that I used was the opioid model, okay. right? The state of emergency on opioids. And I needed to understand exactly what that was because I'm like, okay, if this is an issue around, you know, addiction, why didn't they just say a state of emergency on addiction? Yeah. They specifically named it opioids. So the more I started really understanding systematically how that worked, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> I didn't like it, yeah. but at the same time, it made sense. And there was a model that I was able to duplicate and revise. So that's how I came up with the state of emergency on opioids, because the way that they addressed that issue was so aggressive. Yeah. And we're seeing the results of it now, at least here in Cincinnati. I mean, the, the opioid you know, addiction rates have gone down. Um, a lot of the, you know, the calls that the uh, emergency calls have, have reduced. So we're seeing the effects of it. So I'm like, okay, it really blew me away again. I, I was sad again because I'm like, why is childhood trauma not addressed, you know, with, 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 with that same aggression, with a state of emergency? So we created a state of emergency on childhood trauma um, policy. And we, we actually wrote the policy. And it's uh, HCR 45, mm -hmm. where we're demanding that our governor declares a state of emergency on childhood trauma because that will unleash those dollars to fix the issue. Because just like, you know, a natural disaster, a tornado or a storm, mm -hmm. childhood trauma is a biological effect, which would make it the worst natural disaster known to man. So release those dollars so that we can fix the issue. Wow. So it's so deep and you really, you went into the research uh, sometimes we hear about people and organizations where they just hear buzzwords and then they take an issue and run. But you've really, you've taken it to heart uh, from your unfortunate lived experience and going through and like you said, mirroring the, uh, the opioid uh, state of emergency uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, name and, and to go after the, the policy for uh, state of emergency on childhood trauma. And, I guess how how do you how did you connect all the pieces? Because like, it's I'm sure it was complex. It didn't happen overnight or one or two days. But when you decided, okay, here's what we're going to do: the, the hunger strike. We're going to kick it off. Uh, how did you how did you connect? Did you have a, a game plan of in ten days or thirty days, or it, was it just a I don't want to say uh, you know as, as you go and as, as you're learning because that's. I guess how I've gone about things. I I'd like to think I'm a good planner, but then when you know reality comes in, it's like okay, life kind of comes in and it, it might take you a different direction. So I'm just curious on that process because I think there are uh, some of our audience uh, might might get hung up on the process of it. Of okay, I'm in. You know what what can I do, uh, and not knowing everything that kind of comes with it. Yeah, for me, honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and I told that, you know, when I would um, find volunteers that want to be a part of it, you know, these were people that had PhDs, mm -hmm. you know, and I had to explain to them that I just need you to trust me. Mm -hmm. I have no clue what I'm doing. But when I do do it, I know exactly what I'm doing. And they didn't really understand that at first, of course, because they look at me, you know, I dropped out of school in the 10th grade. Right. So these are people, like I said, with masters and with PhDs and they're like, OK, but you want us to follow you? And I told them, yes, because I, I, I know that this task, this mission, I, I was molded for. It. 
So the first step was, like I said, being honest that I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But when the idea came to me to do the hunger strike, I knew exactly what to do. Even though nobody joined me, I reached out to uh, uh, religious leaders. I reached out to community leaders. Nobody would join me on this hunger strike. So I knew right then and there that I had to become the movement. If nobody would, would be a part of it, I had to be the movement myself. And this is something that I actually teach to other younger activists, is you become the movement first, right? So uh, like I said, so then, you know, when it came down to really knowing how to move forward in, uh, on a policy level, I didn't know what to do, but I'm smart enough to know that there's models out there. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm a consultant. And one of the things that I've done over the years as a consultant was, I would never tell a customer, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. I'm taking a contract, right? And what I, I'll, the only thing that I'll do is I'll find a successful model and just duplicate and revise it. So I was smart enough to, you know, to know that. So like I said, I, you know, I told my team, I, I have no clue what I'm doing, but when I do do it, trust me, it's the right move. So I actually, uh, I, I, I shadowed a, a, a group in, in Columbus. Uh, they were from, I forgot, Dayton. I believe they were from Dayton, Ohio. Okay. And they were pushing for a single payer uh, insurance. Mm -hmm. I forgot the whole issue surrounded, but but it was for about insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so I asked if I can just shout it because I need to understand how things worked inside the state house. I had never even been in there before. Mm -hmm. So when I say that I literally didn't know, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So they allowed me, you know, to shadow them as they went from from uh, legislator to legislator, you know, meeting with different ones about this issue and about the, you know, the about their uh, the policy, and just watching gave me kind of a blueprint on how I need to move forward, you know, with my team. So of course, you know, we uh, I, after that was over with, mm -hmm. months later I started setting up my own meetings with legislators okay. who I thought would be supportive of a move like this, uh, and I was I was greatly disappointed. <clears throat> Because naturally, I went to, of course, a lot of Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, and especially Black Democrats. I thought that this would just be a you know walk in the park, mm -hmm. and it wasn't well received at all. And I was really surprised by you know by that. So went back to the drawing board, and one of my team members was the president of the Tea Party Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. He's super conservative, right? Mm -hmm. And people to this day are like, "How is he on your team?" <laughs> and I had to explain to him, you know, politically, right, like how that worked. That doesn't, you know, because he's a, a a conservative or even a Trump supporter, it doesn't make him, you know. I mean, he's he's a, he's a really good, great guy, right? He's super supportive of humanitarian issues. So they were like, okay, you know, it makes sense. He was the one that actually told me uh, that he had a friend who was a legislator, a Republican. He said, let me set up a meeting. We met with him. I laid out the entire issue you know, for him as much as I had at the time. And he said, Ron, this makes sense. I'll sponsor your bill. He uh, he reached out to another Republican that said the same thing. He said, yeah, I don't understand how the legislators that we met with, you know, in the beginning, the Democrats, he said, I, I don't understand how they didn't get this, why they didn't jump all over this. Like, it's perfect, even if it's just for, you know, for, for a campaign. Right. It's perfect. So they came on board as sponsors, and as we started moving forward, I started learning more and more about how uh, the political game, the political game works. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was introduced to the committee. We had committee hearings. Um, I was able to put together some, uh, some, some, you know, proponents for it, and we started moving forward from there. So the more knowledge I gained on how the political system worked, the more I was able to put together this plan on how to move forward. Then we got hit with COVID. And everybody was like, okay, things are just going to shut down. You're not going to be, be able to do anything. And so one, one, one of, one of my, 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 my key gifts is strategy. Uh, and, and that's how I've been able to move, you know, move through this journey is being really strategic. So one of the things that I came up with was during COVID, since everybody uh, you know, will be confined to their homes, you know, close to radios or, or TVs, let's launch an awareness campaign. Uh -huh. So I reached out to some radio stations and, and I got some uh, uh, some huge uh, sponsorships that actually paid for the uh, paid for the ads, and we launched a full awareness campaign on childhood trauma. What is childhood trauma? And helping people understand that piece first, because if you don't know what you're sick from, you can't heal. So we we utilized that entire time you know, during COVID to, to to launch the awareness campaign 
as I just continued to prepare, prepare for you know the outcome of COVID. And then after COVID was over, of course, we went right back to the state house, back to committee hearings. And now we're actually on the federal level. We're working with J.D. Vance's team to push it so that he could take it to the president and get it declared on the federal level. Wow, that's that's awesome. I mean, it, you're you've literally like, like a grassroots issue. Like you've literally worked from the ground up. Like you said, you said, I don't know what I'm doing, but when I get there and do it, you're you'll know, and it'll all make sense. Um, I'm curious on maybe the more I would say like finding your calling of you know, you've done a, 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 many different things th throughout your life. Uh, and, very successful when this issue kind of came to you of like, yeah, like we need to do something about it. Can you just walk through, you know, if, if somebody at home or is listening on the subway or train somewhere is, you know, battling between a couple things to, that they want to do and they're not really sure, how, how did you know, all right, this is what I, these were the, the, the signs, and I know there's, it's not a direct science to it, but uh, you know, if, if somebody is, is in between uh, things, maybe, it's a, it, maybe they're in college and they're in between majors and they're like, oh, well, I like marketing, but I also like criminal justice. And uh, can you maybe just walk through that, that mental process that like, you went through and, and as things started to click, you're like, yeah, like, this is what I'm, this is what I need to do right now. Oh man, uh, so that was kind of tricky for me because I, I I tried to walk away from it multiple times. Oh, I think that right there definitely is a sign. If you can't walk away from it, that's where you need to be. You know that that's where your journey is leading you back to. You know, it's kind of like the book uh, The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. You know, he went on his journey just to lead right back to where he started from. So, you know, for me, that was, that's where my heart stayed. That's where my heart was planted. And I knew this was an issue that I, that I had to stay with, you know? And then as I started being committed to that issue, my consistency really kind of dug me deeper into it and rooted me deeper into it. You know, that's why I, I, I tell people all the time, you know, uh, it's just a, a, a movement is just that mm -hmm. moving. That's it. Cause you know, like I said, not knowing what to do, right? Mm -hmm. But as long as I'm moving, that's all the movement is, and that's all I did was I continued moving, and my journey just kind of unfolded itself. Yeah, and it and it takes time. I, I I think sometimes with our society, and I know me personally, one quick answer is a quick fix, and as you learned at, throughout your process and as you're learning that there's certain steps and ways to, to, to go about it. And although it should, the issue should be taken care of like relatively quickly because of the hurdles that are out there politically and in, in the community, uh, the persistence, did that also come back to like you, once you got started, like you, you couldn't walk away from it. So that just kept you you know, motivated, you know, day to day to day uh, with, with what, what you're doing. I'm like, okay, I'm going to reach out to this person. I'm going to meet with this person. I'm going to go to the, the, the state house. I'm, I'm going to, I don't I guess I don't even know how, how you get on the schedule to get on the floor to talk about things. But you, you, like you said, you're, you're just continuously moving through, through the process. So like, okay, as things are coming along, you can look back now and say, yeah, this one thing led to this connection and this connection led to here. But when you're in the moment, you're like you said, you're just moving. You're just moving from conversation to conversation to meeting to meeting, uh, using your you know, your gifts, uh, especially with strategy of just continuing on and, and utilizing. And I think that's helpful for students or really anybody that we have transformational gifts. So whether you're consulting, uh, with your consulting business or you're working on the issue to make this a childhood trauma declare that a state of emergency on the, on the federal level, your strategy gift is able to transcend wherever you're at. If you're in front of a client or you're in front of a lawmaker, uh, if you're in front of a media personality or you're, you're doing an interview like, like this, you're, you're able just to use those gifts and just kind of put on a little bit of a different hat, but you know, you're, the, you're the same person using that same strategy. 
Yeah. I like to use a, a technique called life stream. You know, they have a thing called live stream. I like live stream. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned this technique from uh, from Aaron F. So, of course, you know, he, he's uh, he's deceased. Mm -hmm. But he does a lot of teachings on, on live stream. And, and basically what that looks like for me is I picture and imagine what it looks like to have this done. Okay. And if I can imagine, if I can, if I can, you know, create that, that that scenery in my head, then I can connect it with my body and get those emotions and those feelings on what what it would feel like to actually have this thing completed and manifest. And I stay there. I give me a nice, comfortable, lazy boy chair uh -huh. and a a bucket of a popcorn in my imagination, mm -hmm. and I stay right there in that moment, stay right there in that feeling. But at the same time, of course, like I said, this is going on in my imagination, mm -hmm. but in real life, mm -hmm. I still have to live this thing all the way out. I have to live out the resistance. I have to live out the pain, the rejection. I have to live all of this out still, right? So this is where I call life streaming because it's like, okay, I'm going to stay right here mm -hmm. in this place of completion, but at the same time, I'm going to watch the process play out. And as I watch the process play out and, I, and, and I'm able to tap back into the that the, the, those emotions, those feelings, it really kind of helps guide me, you know, through those really dark areas where it just feels like, what are you doing? Stop. Just give it up. Because wow. there's times this just seems almost impossible. I mean, when you look at the scope of, of, of the work that we're doing, yeah, it literally looks impossible. It does. People would have never expected for me to have gotten as far as I, as I had. You know, and, and I honestly didn't expect, you know, especially in this short amount of time. I mean, we, we've been really moving the needle. You know, our goal is to get to the UN after we have declared mm -hmm. on the state level, federal level, then from there we plan on going to the UN. Because like I said, tra trauma is a global issue. You know, we think about what's going on around the world, the wars, the, 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 the poverty, the, the experience in these children are experiencing as, as little children that have to grow up to be adults one day. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That, that what we see now in the adults, are an example of trauma expressing itself. We live in a world of trauma expression, but we rather say, uh, let's focus on crime. Let's focus on gun reduction. Let's focus on all these issues that are only trauma expressions. You know, like I spoke for the NAACP last year, mm -hmm. and they wanted me to speak in support of uh, a gun reform. Okay. And I couldn't. When, that, when the mic came to me, I, I, I just couldn't. Because, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to help explain to the viewers was the triggers on guns aren't the problem. The triggers in our nervous systems, the triggers in our children's nervous systems that call for the response of these guns, for the need for these guns, those are the triggers we need to be focusing on. Like I said, we don't give any attention, any any true attention to childhood trauma. You know, we, we, don't, we don't really come with that same aggression as we do for gun reform for that same, you know, uh, issue of opioids. Mm -hmm. Childhood trauma we deal with with kid gloves. And, you know, one of the things that uh, an aide to a, a representative, a state representative told me, he said, well, why should we declare a state of emergency on it? Isn't there wraparound programs to handle it? Mm. And I said, uh, the issue around opioids was addiction, right? Isn't there wraparound programs to deal with that? So why didn't you let the, why didn't you let the wraparound programs happen instead of this? The state felt like they need to get involved in declaring a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. And of course, he couldn't respond. He didn't, literally didn't even ask for that. And I was like, right, that's what I'm talking about. You asked me, why does a state of emergency need to be declared on this? But you supported the state of emergency on opioids. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, that's wow. I love the way your mind works because you're, I mean, it, these are real life issues. People are making decisions and you brought it right back to that individual who had voted and supported a certain way and that mirrored that process like the, you said the wraparound programs and some of those things uh mental health separate uh but the same thing some of the resistance like i'm running into with you know as far as supporting you know organization it's like Shouldn't the insurance take care of it? Sure, you know, don't, aren't there programs already out there? Like, why, why, do, we, why do we need to support this? And I, I love the way that you, you took the opioid and that wraparound and you're like, okay, well, you supported this and it moved through. So why, why shouldn't we support this? And I would think children, 
would be like a super top priority just in general of you know the children of the future you know going back to different sayings and of like like you said don't don't use the the the, the soft clubs with, with with that issue that this needs to be addressed and it's going to take some concrete action to make it actually happen yeah, yeah. i mean we, we have to be intentional about it because anything else it, it won't move the needle, you know, especially when you understand childhood trauma on a systematic level, because that's what it is. I mean, it's very systematic, mm -hmm. you know, even so, especially like, you know, you look at in, in our, in the black community, you know, you look at the hundreds of years of terrorism and trauma. How, how do you think that's going to play out in, in, in the long term? Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about over the course of 20, you know, 25 years, you know, I, I can create, you know, one generation. That's tens of thousands, you know, of individuals. Right. Now, you know, time that on hundreds, time that on millions. I'm the residual of slavery. When you understand childhood trauma and the epigenetics of it, the epigenetics is the transfer of trauma in our DNA. So now, like I said, so when you really start to look at it, you know, from, 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 that, from that set of lenses, it's like, wait a minute, this issue is humongous. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want our children to go to school, behave properly, you know, uh, 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 excel in, in academics, but yet we're sending them to school traumatized. Hmm. It, it, it doesn't connect. So that's why I said to not address it, you know, with, with the same persistence and aggression as we did the opioid issue, it, it, it goes to show a lot of intention, neg negative, you know, in, intentions. I should say, because how do you deal with addiction? Addiction is rooted in trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's almost like eating the icing and leaving a cake. Right. Yeah. You got a, a wonderful looking chocolate cake here. You decide I'm just going to eat the icing and leave the cake. Leave the, cake. the cake is the, is, is the trauma. The icing is like eating the, you know, the addiction and leaving what is rooted in. It doesn't even make any sense. No, it, it doesn't. Uh, your your book Diamond. How how did that manifest a, it itself of wanting to express yourself in in a book? Because I understand a little bit of the writing process. It's it's not just cut and dry. I mean, it takes a lot of time to put it together. It takes a lot of drafts. Uh, a lot of a lot of things go into it, and many people can do many different uh, different things than you know to sit down and. And, and like hammer out, hammer out uh, uh, a book. So how did how did that come about, and how did that make you feel once it was, was out and that content was available? Uh, it actually was easy for me. Um, so I have a I have a I have a, um, I have a, 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 a brain tumor mm -hmm. and a speech impediment, and I have to really work really hard, you know, making sure I stay aware of it. Mm -hmm. But but I write actually better than I speak. Even though I have two TEDx talks lined up and motivational speaker, <laughs> uh, I, I, I like to write, you know, more than anything. So for me, it was easy. Mm -hmm. And what made it even easier was the fact that I live, I lived. It. This is my story. So when I close my eyes, all I have to do is replay the story and just type. Yeah. And from there, you know, sent it to my editor. Uh, I designed the cover myself. Okay. So, and, and, and like I said, I mean, for me, it was just about putting up the content of my, of my story that I've lived and being able to write, you know, sit there. It's almost like watching a movie mm. and actually typing out, you know, everything you've seen. That was pretty simple for me, you know, designing the cover. So the cover is me looking into a, a glass and my son's, that's actually my son's as a baby, picture staring back at me. And the reason why I designed it like that was because this was me discovering what childhood trauma was. This was me discovering my own story yeah. and my son's story. And I thought that the cover fit perfectly. Man, you're, you're having such a profound impact. How does, how does it, that just make you feel uh, that you are moving the needle, that in a matter of six, eight months or, or so, uh, the, the movement is where it is, the progress that, that's been made, to know that you can have a positive impact with all the craziness that's out there in, in the world, the negativity, the divide, 
to actually be doing something positive and, and have that, that movement, uh, does that feel validating to, to what you, you're, you're doing uh, and, and keeping you kind of the day to day uh, of uh, what, what you need to do to continue that, that movement? No, and uh, honestly, it's it's uh, disheartening. It's disheartening because people don't that pe people want a luxury movement. See, Black Lives Matter is a luxury movement, mm -hmm. right? It's easy to put the, you know a black T-shirt on with BLM, raise your hand in the air, take the selfies, post on social media. I went to a Black Lives Matter event and then hashtag BLM. That's easy. Mm -hmm. That's luxury. A movement like mine actually requires real sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It's self-funded. I don't have, you know, I mean, I'll put up GoFundMe's and people mm -hmm. would just completely pass it up as if you know, it was nothing. But yet they talk about how incredible the work is we're doing. Um, you know, I'll put together an event for a rally at like our local city hall and four people will show up. You know, I've reached out to every religious leader that talks about the love of God mm -hmm. healing me in their life. And say, okay, this is what we're doing. We're at, you know, be a part of this. So to be honest with you, it's really disheartening mm -hmm. because, you know, when, when I have to go to, to, to DC to go meet with legislators there, I have to pay for that <laughs> out of pocket. Yeah. And people, people, uh, people don't really understand how serious this issue is. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially in, in my community. And I, I can say this, you know. For sure, that that we, our 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 our, our chaos, has become our normalcy, mm -hmm. right? So the world is burning down. I just had a meeting uh, with the, a, a pastor this morning, mm -hmm. and I was I was expressing to them, you know, my frustration with the church. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I don't understand. You know, you all go inside this building, and you know, happy and joyous and praising, but yet on the outside of this building, the world is burning down. Yeah. And, and, and I said, and you all call, you all are preaching to save people. They're supposed to be already saved. Mm -hmm. I said, but yet the world is out here in dire need. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it gets really frustrating because it's like everybody else has on a, a pair of rose-colored lenses, and I feel like I'm the only one that's out here that's like, you, you didn't just see that. <laughs> yeah. Like, are you serious? <laughs> you don't see what's going on over there. Like, are you serious? It's bad out here. Our children are dying at record number. You know, we don't see, we don't hear about the children. See, and Black Lives Matter, they don't cover the mm -hmm. children that die under the hands of child protective services. That's a humongous issue. More children die under the care of child protective services than unarmed black men by the hands of police. Mm -hmm. But we don't hear any numbers around that. We don't hear any movement, no names. You know, nobody's posting. I am, you know, Trayvon Martin or this person, that person. Nobody's posting that. Mm -hmm. So those children are completely voided oh. and they don't even have a voice of, they, they, they don't have a, a voice of their own or a supportive voice to let people know hey we need your help down here and the thing is there's millions of them yeah and the way you touched on the self-funding when you have to go to dc you're paying for that when when expenditures come about you're paying for that you ask for support like other organizations other movements and the the the, the people showing up is it, it, it's kind of like you said the rose colored glasses like wait a minute like are you seeing what kind of what's going on like you think that this isn't a, a problem like at what at what reality is that and i i think i know from the experience i'm going through uh, some of some of the same thing. Things are self-funded, trips, and if you want to do something, you want to make a statement, you're funding that. If you're going somewhere or you're putting a, a, a campaign, a media campaign out there, you're funding that. That there's no big corporation, you know, behind the scenes. Like there, one might come and go, and you know, sponsor to get their name on something. But from a, you know, it, we look at like expenditures of being 100%. I mean. They might be putting five or ten percent, and like, well, who's paying the other ninety? And I, I've come across that. Well, oh, you're 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 backed by uh, a real estate company. And like, well, they're a sponsor. But when we look at kind of the bigger picture, like what's going on, 
it's very minimal. Uh, you know, we're very grateful for sponsors. We don't take it for granted. Uh, but when it, it's just interesting, and it, the way you talked about the rose colored glasses, um, it, people, I think, just in general, need to like, kind of wake up to what's going on. And, and the religious community, that, like you said, your word disheartening, uh, disheartened, that's really disheartening from the religious community. People that, like you said, they come inside that building and, and, and share uh, the gospel and the word and, 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 and collect the, you know, the tithe and the, the donations. But then once you walk outside that door, it's like, okay, that's not happening. Like there's, there's, no, there's no trauma in this church or in this community because it's a gated community or whatever the, the reasons are. It's hard, and I think when somebody knows that and understands that and sees all that work that people like yourself are putting into it, that it isn't that you know random selfie or just showing up to an event and hashtagging and, and being done and you know on a half hour or an hour event or whatever the time frame be like you're spending many hours. It's not like a thirty or forty hour work week. I mean you're spending all sometimes odd hours to be able to do things on other people's schedule because it's like, well, I really don't want to do something on like a Sunday afternoon, but if that's the only time I can meet with somebody, like I got to do it because if I don't, then that, that's going to pass me up. Uh, and I think that per persistence of you just, you're going after that goal. You, you've envisioned that. You've envisioned uh, the completion of that. I think that is, that's a helpful tool to, to use. And I think I need to, to do that because there are, like you said, there's so many setbacks and the resistance and questioning yourself. Like, am I really doing the right thing? Like people, I was thinking people would support me and, uh, and, and, and they're not, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna continue going. The answer, it's always gonna be no if you don't try. Um, but when you do hear those no's, it's like if, if what you're going after, like the why, uh, you're not going after the symptoms. You're going after the core issue, and uh, you're not cherry picking and going, "Okay, well this is easy. Someone's going after this piece." Like you're going after the leaves. Like, no, no, I, I need to go after the tree. I need to go after the trunk. Uh, and can you talk about just just that tenacity of a, you know a business leader out there, a, a self starter, somebody that wants to go into business for themselves that might be thinking like, "Oh, it's I'm going to be my own boss and." Uh, things are going to be easy or easier versus here's the reality. You know, you've, you know, have, you know, 20 plus years of experience, cross-functional, across industries, many different ways uh, of just sharing what, what that's like. It's like if somebody's thinking about going into business because they want the easy road, that might not be, <laughs> that might not be the best thing. Yeah, if they're looking for the easy road, they would, they're not going to be a good entrepreneur. You know, so my, my own personal entrepreneur story, mm -hmm. um, I was homeless. I was actually sleeping on a park bench. Oh my God. This was in 2000. I was sleeping on a park bench, and every day I would wake up and I would go to the Cincinnati Library. Okay. And uh, how I found out about this, because where I come from, in the, the neighborhood I grew up in, we, we, we never heard of business plans. <laughs> we didn't know what that was. We didn't know what LLC, you know, LLCs and mm -hmm. S-Corps. Like, but I, I stopped at a bank one day. And I walked in, they had a, a sign on the window that said, you know, business loans. I walked in and said, hey, how can I get a business loan? I got a business idea. And the first thing they asked me was, do I have a business plan? I said, no. Like I said, I didn't even know what it was. Uh -huh. But I told them, I'm, I said, I'm working on it. <laughs> My working on it was me going to the Cincinnati Library and asking for a book on what the hell is a business plan? Mm -hmm. And then once I learned what a business plan was, my next book was, how do you write one? So while I was homeless and sleeping on this park bench, I wrote a business plan. I had a friend of mine, she, I was a secretary. After I finished with it, I gave her tons of, of pages of these documents that I had rolled up and asked her to you know, type it up for me. Mm -hmm. And she did a, an amazing job, put it into a full business plan for me, my, my numbers in Excel, everything. And uh, so one of the things that, that, that I would do, you know, during this time period while I was homeless was I would go around to different uh, businesses that I seen downtown, people standing outside, and I would just ask guys, "Hey, can I cut your hair? I can cut your hair right at your desk while you continue to work." So one guy in particular, this, uh, this uh, middle-aged black guy, he took me on as his barber. So I'm cutting his hair, 
And he, he asked me, he said, man, what's your goal? Like, what's your plan? Mm -hmm. it just, you know, and I told him, well, I, I kept it real with him. I said, man, I'm homeless. This is how I put a little money in my pocket for right now. But mm -hmm. I'm not going to be this way long. I told him, I said, you might want to find another barber because I'm going to be a wealthy entrepreneur. So he laughed as if I was joking, right? And I gave him that straight look on my face, like, to let him know, I'm not playing. Mm -hmm. So he asked me, he said, well, you know, tell me more about your business idea. So I did. And he said, you know what? You need to meet the owner of this company. Wealthy gentleman, you know, from uh, from suburbs, and mm -hmm. you know, you probably might want to invest. I said, okay, cool. So he actually tried to take me to introduce him, to introduce me to him, and this guy didn't want to hear anything. Didn't want to meet me, no nothing, right? So I said, okay, cool. I wasn't, I wasn't bothered. And I ended up moving into a men's shelter, a men's homeless shelter downtown Cincinnati. And that's when the director they were getting ready for this this big uh, breakfast where they do uh, fundraising. And millionaires and billionaires from all over the city, you know, come to the C-Pen, right? So, he, you know, he came to me one day. He said, can I take some pictures of you? You know, what are you working on? I said, I'm, I'm writing my business plan. Mm -hmm. I'm finishing up my business plan, and I'm, I'm going to be a be a wealthy entrepreneur one day. So he said, can I take some pictures of you while you're reading it, while you're working on it? So he did. And then, so he actually invited every all the men that were in the shelter were able to come to this breakfast as well. And so... Now they get up there and they're doing a slideshow and then my picture comes up. Uh -huh. He said, yeah, this is our Ronald Hummins. You know, he, uh, he's in his picture working on his business plan and he plans to be a, you know, a, a successful clothing designer and blah, blah, blah. You know, gave, he even gave a little bit about my background, my history on, you know, where I came from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and like I said, not, so none of that bothered me because I didn't know who these guys are, you know, in this audience. So next week I go back to cut this guy's hair again. And this guy, so he, he's old, he was older. I guess he was maybe in his 70s at the time, older white gentleman, conservative. Somebody you wouldn't expect to be sitting, you know, sitting at the table with me. Mm -hmm. Came back to his office. He said, hey, when you get done, stop at my office and see me. Oh. And I'm kind of nervous. I'm like, for what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so I did. I went back to his office and uh, he said, yeah, I was at the, at the breakfast and uh, you know, I seen, seen your picture up there. So the first thing he asked me was, do you have a business plan? Put it out of my pocket, put it on his table. Uh, and he was like looking through it. And he said, Wow, like where'd you get this from? I said, I wrote it. He said, well, what school did you go to? You know, he thought I went to a college or something. I told him I dropped out of school. I haven't been to any college. Mm -hmm. So he said, How did you learn how to write a business plan? I said, I read a book. <laughs> and he laughed again as if I was joking and I gave him that straight look. Mm -hmm. He said, You you serious? I said, yeah, I read a book. He told me, he said, go find you a lawyer. And I'm like, find a lawyer where? I don't have any money. Right. He said, well, you know, whatever it is you need to do. He said, find a lawyer and have them set up an operating agreement. Something else I was familiar with. I didn't know what an operating agreement was. Mm. So uh, so I did. I actually called the African American Chamber of Commerce. I told him my story, told him who I am. I said, hey, I got this, this, rich, this rich white guy, man, I want to invest some money and tell me, I don't, I need a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So they were like, okay, uh, why don't you come to the president and invite me to come and speak with him? So I went in, and when she met with me, she said, there's something about your energy. She said, I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but I want to help you. She found a, a, a black attorney uh, at one of our biggest law firms here. She told her about my story, told her, you know, I was homeless, told her everything. And the attorney invited me to her office, told her the same thing, you know, uh, and she was like, I don't know what it is about you, but I want to help. She actually paid the money for my filing fee for my LLC. Oh. Um, set up my operating agreement. I told that guy, I said, hey, I got everything set up and ready to go. He met up there with you know, the attorney's office. He wrote a check for $125,000 startup and slid it across the table to me. Wow. To do what I need to do. And years later, I asked him, I said, you know, you just gave me that. You didn't ask to be on the, the banking account. You didn't like nothing. Mm -hmm. And he said, because. He said, I, 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 I knew that it was something about you that I could trust. I knew that if I gave you that money, you were going to do what you said that, that, that you were going to do with. So, you know, and so I actually teach business as well. I teach business in the, in the Ohio prisons. I have a program called Vision Caretakers Inc. And it's the first of its kind where I actually teach, turn inmates into businessmen. I teach them practical business, business step school, um, business development skills. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the first level of it is business plan writing. I teach them how to take their ideas and put it into a full business plan format. But I also teach a class before that, like a life skills class. And one of the things that you know that I teach my students is that good character will take you places that money and education won't. 
because once again, like I said, I dropped out of school in 10th grade, but I've traveled the world. I've lived in Bangkok, Thailand. I've been to Africa. I've been to Korea. Uh, man, I mean, I've been all over. I, I speak other languages. I've done international manufacturing. I've produ produced films, best-selling author. And once again, you know, I've, I've even um, authored academic paper, research papers. I have an academic paper in the International Journal of Science that I wrote on Shadow Trump. Wow. And I did all that with the 10th grade, you know, education. Wow. That's so, I mean, that's so inspiring because some, sometimes individuals will say, well, well, but I don't have that or I didn't finish this. And I, it, here you are, you said, like, I dropped out in 10th grade, uh, went to the library, did studying, wrote it, found somebody to help type it up. And you knew uh, kind of subconsciously there was going to be a time when that was going to, that business plan is going to be needed. And there, yeah, there were rejections along the way there, but that was just feeding that energy of like, okay, I'm on the right path because I, people are telling, they're asking me for this one thing, so I know that this is very important. Uh, and you took it upon yourself. You didn't have to go to the library every day. You didn't have to pick out books on that. It could have been on, I don't know, other topics. But you, you took that energy that, that you had and you, you turned that into that, that initial you know, $125,000 uh, investment in you because that individual saw that, said like, okay, that individual might meet people and they're like, oh, and they don't come as prepared as you did. You're like, oh yeah, like here it is, I did this, I spent time. Uh, and knowing what that individual probably did about how much time and energy it takes to put one together, it's like, wow, if this person took time and energy to do that, like, not that the other part was gonna be easy, but it's like they took time to do kind of the hard part, the dirty work, and now it's like, I wanna do it. I wanna, I wanna turn this into reality. Uh, were, you doing, were you kind of that visualization? At what point in kind of your career did that kind of, kind of come into, into you where you started that vision, envisioning the completion of a project or uh, of a, an agreement? Uh, when, when did that, is that fairly recent or is that just, that's been with you for a while? So before I even knew what it was, I was doing it when I was a little, when I was a young child. So growing up the way I did, you know, I remember sleeping on, on, on a carpet in an abandoned house mm. during the winter. And I would dream that I was somebody big time. Uh -huh. So I've always been a visionary. And, and, and I think that's actually what helped fuel me even during my roughest times, because, you know, but when you're in a, in a situation like like I was as a child, the dreams are the only thing that I could hold on to because I had nothing else. You know what I'm saying? So those hopes and those dreams that I can be that, as, especially with it being here, I can see it. I know what it felt like physically. It, so like I said, before I even knew about it, Aaron Neville, I was already doing that. And, and those dreams were helped me to really hold on, you know, hold on to it. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I tell my clients today is you got to build that boat during the dry season. You know, when I'm talking about when the ground is completely dry and cracked open and, and, and there's no sign of, of, of a cloud coming, that's when you build your boat. So, and, if, and for me, that's what it was about. It was like, okay, you know what? I have to do the work now. I have to build my boat because when it starts to rain, so guess what the rain was for me? At hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, shit. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, and, and guess what? If I, if I had built my boat, I would have drowned. Right. Oh wow. So yeah, it, it, build your boat during the dry season. I love that. You know, even when it looks like there is no sign of rain coming, just stay consistent. Consistency is everything. Yeah. So before we close out, where can people learn more about you, the movement? Uh, help out volunteer just be a part of your your activity because it's 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 enlightening it's positive and it's taking uh topics and turn it into action it's not i'm gonna do this it's like you have that vision but then you go after it and uh, I, I can imagine there's gonna be people that are like yeah like that energy to be able to do all of the things that you have 
the short amount of time that you've been able to move with, uh, with, with the, the childhood trauma, uh, state of emergency, uh, bill, trying to get that from the ground up to the state, the federal, and then the uh, then UN, and make that national. Uh, yeah, how can, how can people find about the book? Just you know, your plug. <laughs> So you can find find me on at my website at Ronald A as an Apple Cummins H U M M O N S dot com. www.ronaldahummins.com. You can find everything on there from my books, more information about the movement, and all. Great. Ronald, thank you so much for your time, uh, being so generous. Uh, sharing your story, all the work you're doing, tips that have helped you along the way. Uh, and I, I just, again, thank you for spending a, an hour with us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, and we also want to thank you, our guests. Uh, I want to thank our guests, Mr. Ron Hummins. We want to thank you, our audience, our viewers, our listeners. They're checking out the transcript. Uh, this this uh, this guest we we just have Mr. Ronald Hummins, uh, he he's, he has uh, that that energy uh, that positivity of making things happen and, and, and doing them and doing the legwork. So if that aligns with you and and your interests or you know uh, individuals that that might uh, align with, please re reach out to him and uh, and help drive his his movement his, his ideas because. Uh, this this person uh, is putting in, in the work. Uh, so thank you for, for listening. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for uh, checking out our transcript. Uh, this has been a, another episode of the Voices for Voices TV show and podcast. I am your host, Justin Allen Hayes. Uh, we'll see you next time. And until then, uh, please be a voice for you or somebody in need.